This episode is brought to you by HP+. In a world full of smart devices, isn't it about time your printer got smart too? Now printing is smart with HP+. And the HP Smart app is how it all happens. You can print from your phone with just a tap, no matter where you are. Even from your garage slash home office slash yoga studio. Huh, that is smart. HP+. Learn more about smart printing at hp.com slash smart. This episode is brought to you by Disney+. Plus. Disney Plus, Hulu, ESPN Plus, stream all your favorites with the Disney Bundle. Disney Plus has Loki and Luca. On Hulu, watch originals like American Horror Story and Nine Perfect Strangers. And ESPN Plus has every match of Spain's thrilling La Liga. Get the Disney Bundle today for only $13.99. Includes Hulu ad-supported plan. Access content from each service separately. Terms apply. See the DisneyBundle.com for details. <laughs> Hi folks, welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick, here to talk about the defensive line today, and, and specifically some age now on this Ravens defensive line. It's not a new thing, but it's certainly probably gotten a little worse over the last couple of years. Here to talk to me about it is Bill Knight. How you doing, buddy? Good, Ken. How you doing today? Uh, no complaints about it. It's uh, we're, we've got our air conditioner finally working again, which is something, and and that's uh, that's uh, it's just got a lot more pleasant here in this room in the last ten minutes. I can talk to you, but let's talk about Ravens and and uh, and what's going on with the defensive line, and, and kind of why don't you set it up for us in terms of of uh, where you think the Ravens are right now and some of the age issues that you've pointed out to us. Right. Thanks, Ken. Um, so I mean, you you had asked me what kind of concerns we would have, and we all know the wide receivers and and you know the offensive line, and I think kind of an underrated concern that I started talking about this offseason with with buddies of mine and other fans is is just the age of the front uh, defensive line. Brandon Williams, Derek Wolf, and Campbell all well into their thirties and uh, long in the tooth. So. So they they just signed Wolf to a new year new deal. So he's three years. He'll be here uh, starting this one. But Williams and Campbell are both extremely big money players in the last year of their contracts. I think most people think they will not be here this year. So the problem at least has a light at the end of the tunnel. You know what's really good, and we ought to be celebrating, is the fact that we get to have players play the last year of their contracts. This is two guys who are obviously stars. They're, they're playing out their contracts in their entirety, which is fantastic news for the Ravens. Those contracts are typically structured to anticipate a cut in the final year. Yes, agreed, especially with you know expectations of another big year this year, you know, before the Lamar Jackson deal is getting done. So just kind of all culminating, and it's nice to get those guys, you know, to finish this contract out. So, so next year, some defense money probably moving from defense to offense. I think we all agree. Um, the offense has been historically efficient for the first three, well, for the second and third year of Lamar's. Uh, you know, run here, Correct. Uh, and and they're now uh, you know you know going to start to accumulate some bills. And Ronnie Stanley was the first of that, but there are more to come because next year Andrews and um, Bozeman, yep. um, and who else now besides Jackson? Um, you got to start thinking about Hollywood soon. What you're going to do there? Here, yeah, yeah. Uh, one way or the other, you know. Yeah. So yeah, the price tags are going to flip to the other side of the line of scrimmage here. It looks like so. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so, so what do you, who do you want to start by talking about in terms of of value here? Well, really, I uh, when I think of the defensive line, I think of Brandon Williams. Uh, traditionally, when we lose him for whether it's a stretch of games, a game, a half, uh, we struggle against uh, the rushing uh, offense. So, going back to 2017, he missed four games, and we were one and three in those games, and I believe eight and four in the next ones, uh, in the ones that he did play. Um, rush yards allowed with him was uh, 84 yards per game, uh, and it was uh, 91.83. If you include, I'm sorry, I messed that up. Uh, sorry, rush yards allowed without Brandon Williams was 169 yards per game. With him was 84 yards per game if you yeah. take out the first game back, which I took out. It's 91 if you include the Vikings. That was 169 yards that game. If you, I took that one out just for, for kicks, and it's uh, 84 yards per game if you take that first game back. Uh, 2018, he plays all season. And what do you know? <laughs> We're number one or two in the league in defense. 
2019, we all know the, the Nick Chubb three touchdown game. In fact, I think uh, that's the game where Earl Thomas and Brandon Williams got into it a little bit after the yeah. game. And he did miss the Steelers game week 17 that year. I won't count that. Everybody rested and uh, we played pretty well. So then you come to last year, he missed the Philly game. Let's see, 194 yards. He got hurt early in New England, 173 yards. Tennessee, another 173. Last year, Pittsburgh at Pittsburgh, we did pretty good. That was the COVID game. But mm -hmm. Pittsburgh was an awful rushing uh, offense right. last year as well. So uh, there's a clear pattern there. Um, and we can kind of flush this out. Uh, you know, we did play against Derrick Henry without him. That is obviously a, a top flight running back there as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ken will touch on the fact that that – force Ellis to play more snaps and he starts to wear out. Yeah, the, the easiest tweet I ever have is when Brandon Williams either has or is about to miss a game, I automatically go back and do the average rushing yards per game. I do yeah. it every time he misses this one. I'm uh, sure people are getting used to it by now. Um, uh, you mentioned Ellis because he's one of the players who I think is a very good backup nose tackle. I right. think he does a lot of things well for you, right. but you really have to manage his snap count. He has to be down in the 15 to 20 snap count range and not up in the 50s, which he has been in some of these games. Mm -hmm. And even I remember last year, Tennessee, I'm thinking, okay, we're holding up our all right, we're holding up all right. And then the floodgates just kind of open there that fourth quarter. And then in that, you know, we all know, you know, the overtime game ended with a long Henry touchdown. So absolutely a clear example of Ellis getting worn down at the end of the game. Right. The Ravens actually are one of the teams in the entire league who plays about the fewest defensive linemen per snap. And the reason is that they play this race car package or NASCAR, some people call it, that have four outside linebackers on passing downs and usually only one or sometimes zero defensive linemen. So they'll be uh, they'll have a fair number of plays where they don't even have a defensive lineman. They just have one on the field. They have right. a lot of other pass rush packages where they kick McPhee inside. You just have one. And, uh, you know, they don't play all that much base defense. They do play a little bit of jumbo nickel where you have three def three defensive linemen. But the games you're talking about, New England and Tennessee last year, were very heavy games for these three down linemen packages. And, right. and it really put a lot of pressure on, on the guys who were left. Correct, correct. Um, New England game last year was brutal. And, and I saw it coming, too. You know, Brandon Williams, was, uh, he got hurt. I think Campbell was already out because he got hurt at Indy the week before. <laughs> Uh, Williams got hurt early. I think he played 9% snaps uh, looking at the uh, tallies. And uh, mm -hmm. I just put my head in my hands because I knew it was coming. And then you saw that first half. And uh, I had to wake up early anyway. I think I maybe packed it up early <laughs> that oh, night. Boy. So, yeah. Um, so, I guess really looking at, you know, who's behind those guys. Uh, you know, obviously, and we all know this, a big year from BK, And uh, I'm really um, – really looking for big things for him and maybe you can talk about it a little bit uh as far as i i, I want to know how much can you think he can contribute as far as can he fill in for williams wolf and campbell or, or he's kind of interchangeable there um because i mean it's a big year for him yeah that that's a great point i, I mean matt bk is a extraordinary disrupting three tech but because he's so undersized right he really doesn't have a lot of positional versatility across the line the way say Derek Wolf does or Clayus Campbell does so Clayus Campbell can, can come in at the three or the five play either he can even kick all the way to the outside and play very effectively uh, Wolf can give you you know time at three time at five if you need him to play some nose tackle I'm sure he could do that as well, well you know, he's got this nice long arms well I tell you what I I think uh I heard somebody mention it on social media last year, and I, I tend to agree. Wolf could have been the unsung hero of that team last oh, year. Yeah. I mean, he, I know we lost those games, but, I mean, man, he, he just ate those snaps up, and, I mean, he was a warrior. Uh, and then come up big in the playoffs. So, yeah, big, big key player for the Ravens. Yeah, completely agree. I mean, we it's it's not that we don't love the Monstars. All three of them are great players. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we it's it's not that we're, we're not, we shouldn't be really appreciative of having them. It's just the the problem they pose, both in terms of salary cap, in terms of what happens when you have an injury, and most importantly, in terms of just you. you all those guys are old at once. You you can't afford to do that, and you have to get younger on the line. And in particular, when we've got all this money rolling over the offense, which I guess is why we live the show with that. Uh, right, and um, just to kind of add something to that. I went back and looked at the past Super Bowl winners and just quickly looked at their starting defensive uh, linemen and just kind of average age. And I mean, it's all under 30. We're looking at, you know, the Bucs were a little old with Sue, 29 years old with the Chiefs, 25 years old, Patriots, 25, 
you know, 28, 25 again uh, for the 2015 Broncos. So, I mean, you know, and it, of course, the NFL is a young guy's, you know, young man's league as is. So, I know it's going to skew that way regardless, but just kind of wanted to throw that out there. It's kind of interesting uh, information I saw. Yeah, I, I, I think that's important. I think it probably their general managers out there thinking, okay, we can have two older defensive linemen, but we can't have three. And the Ravens, right. it's not just the Monstars. They also have Justin Ellis, who's there. And in Ellis's case, I don't think it's as much an issue of his age is really an, an issue for his play. Being a nose tackle, you can often last a little longer. I think it's more an issue of his age means that um, he's no longer a guy who's going to eat up 35 snaps a game. He's a guy you really need to manage it. And, uh-huh. and it, just, it, it makes it difficult for him to be your backup nose for cases where there's an injury. Right, right. And I guess another good reason why, or another good reason um, or uh, you know, having Wink still coming back, you know, he's so good at managing that defensive side. And of course, he's got coaches helping him, but, uh, you know, a little continuity there helps as well. Wow. All right. Um, I want to go back to Matt Abike for a second because mm-hmm. we, we didn't, we, we just hit on the positional versatility thing. And this is obviously a problem, not just for him, really, but I think Broderick Washington's also a little limited in terms of his pers- uh, uh, positional versatility. I think he's really a three tech. I think he'd be a very undersized nose if he's in there. I don't think it's kind of an ideal situation. Maybe you're okay with it on certain down and distance combinations, or you know, that's really what it would have to be because you've got to be willing to give up some stoutness on the defensive line, uh, you know, to, to gain something else in terms of penetration that would be different. But Matabike, honestly, the fact that he's only a three, as good as he is, and I expect him to be a really good pass rusher this year. Yes. Um, it, there's just, just limitations to, to what that gives you. So you can only have one guy like him, and unfortunately – it, does the does the similarity of Braddock Washington pose a problem in your mind? I was, uh, you're you're thinking along the same lines. I, I totally agree. Uh, you, you almost want to have some beef in one guy, and then you know some athletics athleticism in another guy. Uh, they both kind of have that same build. Yeah, you know, I think uh, Williams is three thirty, and Matt BK maybe three hundred, maybe two ninety something. Yeah, two ninety. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, now uh, he's a better athlete, I think. So that. Like mm-hmm. you said, the pass rush, I think that does contribute. But, again, you would like to have a little bit more variety among your backups and then hopefully guys moving into the starter roles next year and, and beyond. So, agreed. Yeah, I mean, one, of, one of the cool things about watching Matt Abike play this preseason, and this goes for all of them, Matt Abike, you know, Washington Crawford, we'll talk about, I'm sure, more. They've all been playing basically from the second series after the Monstars leave all the way to the end of the game and rotating. Right. So they haven't they haven't basically and, and Matabike then has to be okay being out there with the last series of guys. But if you're wondering why the hell are the Ravens dominating so much in quarter four, it's that rotation and that freshness for those players is just an extraordinary benefit. I know you played played some football, Bill. Did you play on the defensive side or the offense? I I started on both, but I ended up moving to strong safety sophomore year. Um, played played at Gilman. I think I I know you're a McDonough guy, so <laughs> uh, rivalry version of the podcast here. Uh, but actually, it was a big thing. Rotating uh, fresh D-line legs in there is big. And I remember yelling at the D-line all the time, get to the quarterback. <laughs> you know what I mean? So having fresh legs in there is big. So, so did, did Gilman uh, rotate their defensive linemen, or were their good defensive linemen too damn good to ever take off the field? Uh, we had uh, we did have a Victor Abbey Amiri who ended up going to Notre Dame. And uh, he actually played for the Eagles, but a couple injuries ended his career short. He, he stayed on the field all the time, but he was uh, the high school version of Julius Peppers. So, so he okay. stayed out there. But other than that, yeah, I mean, we rotated guys in and out. We were big on keeping legs fresh, which is why I stopped playing two ways. At one point, I just was worn down by the end of the game. So that was a big deal. And uh, playing under Stan White and Joe Ehrman, I mean, those guys knew defense. And uh, we cranked it up on that side of the ball for sure. No team can afford to overpay for talent. Build a championship team with Indeed, the smart way to only pay for quality candidates that meet your must-have requirements. When hiring gets hard, you need Indeed. The job site that makes hiring incredibly simple. Just attract, interview, and hire. In fact, with Indeed, you can do all of your hiring in just one place. Indeed knows how important it is to make the most of your recruiting hours and dollars. And with Indeed, you can save time and money by setting your must-have qualifications and only pay for the quality candidates that meet them. Get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Get a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Offer valid through September 30th. Terms and conditions apply. Does this sound familiar? 
You've got one device that lets you catch the game live, another that lets you stream your favorite shows, you're watching sports highlights on your phone, and you've got your neighbor's best friend's login for the good stuff. Well, I want to tell you about a simple way to get all that entertainment you love without the hassle and a great way to finally get your TV together. It's called Direct TV Stream, and it brings you live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before so you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes and no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part? There's no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with Direct TV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. Okay, a lot, lot of great stories about Stan White from, from meeting him at camp and, and talking football. But he, he moved on with uh, Biff to the yes. Francis program. Yes. And I know he happened to be there when the other A-conference teams basically told St. Francis they weren't going to play them anymore. Right, right. So uh, Stan had some interesting ideas about that, by the way. I, just, I don't want to go any further with that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he, he definitely his old-timiness really showed through there. But love the guy in terms of uh, – go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, he, he told taught me so much about football. I've probably forgotten 90% just because it was so much. But I remember I was going into Gilman, my ninth grade. I was still in eighth grade, but I'd already, you know, knew I was going there. So they invited me out for spring football. And, you know, I'm this tiny kid. I'm just at middle linebacker because, like, well, I played linebacker at rec football. And I'm running around chasing the ball. And that's when he told me, like, look, you got to read your keys. And that was the first time I realized, like, oh, yeah, okay, if the guard pulls, you know, the ball, you know what I mean? Like, you have keys, certain position have keys. And then it just kind of opened up a whole new world. And I said, I guess we're going to play real football now. So, yeah, that always that's stuck out to me. to learn the position. Uh, yeah. yeah. You like that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, one, one of the things, I, we got to get into this for just a second. Stan White, one of the best coverage linebackers of all time. And, in fact, he set the record for interceptions by an inside linebacker, by any linebacker, in a season during 1975 when the Colts were having that magical run to come back. <laughs> from one and four to be ten and four and what did what was he able to impart to you because it's a big problem for the Ravens right now mm-hmm. is their inability to they, they don't have inside linebackers who understand what's going on behind them is the way I talk about it so right what what did he tell you about that oh, man I honestly I, I don't know if I could speak to that too much uh, I do remember he just was so good at finding the tendencies of the other team where if a receiver Mount St. Joe was this is a classic example if their slot guys were on the line of scrimmage they were running goes they, they were running uh, streaks right then if they weren't they you know there was other plays but if they were on the line of scrimmage they were running goes so you know that doesn't quite speak to you know getting to your drop and all that but uh, I, I do remember practicing doing the skelly and the inside and uh, it just finding your finding your zone we played mostly zone uh, but finding your zone just keeping your head on the swivel and just understanding what the offense is trying to do to you you know, so you can kind of see it before it comes. So, hey, this guy's clearing out. Well, there's someone else coming behind him because they're trying to manipulate me this way. So, I mean, just a great, great coach. I can't, I can't tell you how much he, he taught me through the years. So, I, it just, uh, I, I, I can see it just from from knowing him around the podium and talking uh, to him there. How much fun that the, the film room was 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 entertaining. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right, let's get back to the Ravens' defensive line. A couple of younger guys, uh, Aaron Crodrick, uh, Aaron, Aaron Crodrick, Aaron Crawford, and Broderick Washington. Mm-hmm. So, Broderick Washington, I was wondering if he was even going to be on the roster, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I know he had the incident back in June, and I kept my eye on it, and then all of a sudden he's kind of shined here um, the, the past two preseason games. So now it kind of looks like, especially given – you know the the age of the front three kind of looks like he's going to be in the mix here and that's really good to see i know we ran down a screen play Mm -hmm. uh down there at carolina that just showed great instinct and football knowledge and just that little play there kind of just you know perked my antenna up and said okay we might have a football player here because we didn't really see him much last year i know matabike did play some but uh i I can't remember much from washington to be honest from you yeah Uh, first of all he didn't make he didn't make a lot of plays uh, right but second of all he didn't really play that many snaps either but the but the plays per snap were distressingly low right and so you know it's great to see him being a whole different penetrating football player this year i just i hope he's got the positional versatility to play more than just the straight up three tech which is you know, obviously it's Matt Abike's role in this defense, and, and he'll have trouble taking taking that away. And it's Campbell's with the first year. Right, right. So, um, 
we'll see what happens with him. But uh, it was exciting to see him make a couple plays here early on in the season. How about Crawford? Crawford, I couldn't really speak to you much about. I can't say I've seen too much from him. Uh, I'm sure, sure you have more information on him. But Matt Abike and Warshin have been, been my two guys that my eyes have been on uh, this entire preseason. Just thinking about, again, who, who's going to step into those roles if needed. So, right. Crawford, a cheap guy, and I believe he's still in year one this year, though he did play in that Pittsburgh COVID game. They didn't they didn't credit a year of service for that, as I understand right. it. So uh, anyway, Crawford is a guy who uh, uh, I think could still help this team. Unfortunately, he's gotten hurt the last couple of days. So, uh, uh, you know, it might be one of these things where it makes it difficult for him to make the team. Also might help the Ravens retain him on the practice uh, squad for when they really need him. Right. I'm sure there's going to be some uh, moves happening there with the uh, IR and all the, all the roster shots that's going to be happening here soon so yeah that, that that's a that's a 45 minute show in its own right so we'll leave it <laughs> Any, anybody else anybody else around the league or what do you expect the the Ravens strategy to be uh after cut down day and this will probably air by the way after cut down day so right, we're, right we're recording this right now on the 25th of August but but you know what kind of moves do you expect from the Ravens in terms of trying to watch the waiver wire do you think a trade is a possibility? Any of that on the on the defensive line? I don't know about a trade, but whatever they do, I'm sure gonna they're gonna try to keep it cheap, given the, the salary of, of you know Williams and Campbell and those front line guys. So it's it's probably somebody we may not have even heard of yet, you know. So yeah. Good, Typical good, Ravens. Good chance. Yeah, they lost the one good UDFA candidate they had this year, Xavier Kelly. Uh, went down pretty early in the process, I think before training camp had even begun in OTAs uh, with a season-ending injury. So that was really uh, unfortunate. Right, right. All right, Bill, pleasure having you on for this. Really appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate you making time. Uh, where can people talk football with you? So I'm on Twitter. Uh, they can talk to me. It's it's at username uh, Sopranos2015. And that's Sopranos as in the show, The Sopranos. I think <laughs> I must have been on an HBO kick when I came up with that handle. <laughs> All right. Well, very good. Anyway, Bill, really appreciate having you on. Other folks out there, if you want to be on a film study short and talk football with me for a few minutes, this is exactly the kind of content we're looking for. Very entertaining stuff. Really interested in hearing about your background at Gilman, too, Bill. Yes, Thanks sir. For coming on. Thank you, Ken. I really, really appreciate the opportunity. We'll talk to you next time on Film Study. Film Study.